So who, who's an undergraduate here? And okay, that's good. And how many are non-science majors? How many are science majors? All right, good. So good balance. So this sort of reflects the students that we see in our in our entrepreneurship minor. How many are any, anybody declared the entrepreneurship minor? Okay, a few of you. Okay. Um, so let me just sort of chat a little bit about some of the things that interest uh, me and my uh, and my research group here at UNC. You know, it's really interesting if you look at all the places on the planet that we need help with in innovation, they're just staggering opportunities for doing something important. You look around um, at the issues that are pending that we really have to address and you think about the disciplines that are going to be required to solve these problems are not just going to come from uh, people with a chemistry focus or a physics focus or a social uh, science focus or a, a, an artistic focus. It's going to take a lot of different people that understand a lot of different skills to make change. Whether you think about the you know, earthquake survivors in Haiti and being able to bring change and, uh, to Haiti, it's going to take a lot of you know, physical activity, architectural issues, but it's also going to understand the French culture and the French language and it's going to take a comprehensive solution to help out there. Or if you think about clean water, and obviously there's a lot of great activities here and people thinking about access to clean drinking water is very important. Energy. Boy, if there's nothing be more important for this planet than imagine if energy were free. Right? We, we have 120,000 terawatts of power hitting our planet every day from the sun. And we as a population consume 15 terawatts. There's 120,000 inbound and we only, and we use 15. So you sort of ask the general question, why do people rob banks? Because that's where the money's at. Uh, the opportunity of converting solar power to useful uh, chemical fuels and electricity, is, that's a really rich place to go because the sun provides a lot to us. Um, so there's a lot of these kinds of uh, opportunities out there. And uh, let me just read this quote to you. It's a little hard to read here. Uh, Research is an expression of faith and a possibility of progress. The drive that leads scholars to study a topic has to include the belief that new things can be discovered, that newer can be better, and that a greater depth of understanding is achievable. Research, especially academic research, is a form of optimism about the human condition. This was uh, by Henry uh, Rozofsky, who was dean uh, at Harvard for many years. And this is, these are the kinds of things that we think about in our research group uh, about what drives our own research programs. And there are some important trends for us to think about, and I think really important for the students to think about regarding where you're at uh, in the world right now uh, in, this, in 2012. Now I'm going to compare this to when I graduated college back in 1986, so I'm dating myself here a little bit. Uh, but just where the United States is playing relative to this global marketplace. I mean, we used to drive the majority of the doctorates. We used to drive the majority of the papers. We used to lead in investments. And now it's a much more level playing field out there. And you just look at the number of researchers across the planet, and it's a, it's a massive uh, group of people that we're all uh, competing and trying to do things in a coordinated manner. And so I'd like to ask a lot of the students out there, you know, how are you going to be competitive given this global landscape and given the fact that we are under tremendous financial pressures today? And so to me, this is not just about doing research. Uh, that I would argue that research alone is not enough, but it's actually trying to be translational and to do things that make a difference uh, in the planet uh, and actually try to do something. And, and uh, let me try to reinforce this. And those of you that are science majors, I want to I challenge you and maybe scare you a little bit. This is the newest employment numbers in the United States in manufacturing. Uh, we used to have about 17 million people doing manufacturing in the United States. It's now down to 12 million. That's a dramatic shift in our economy. There used to be uh, almost a million people working in the chemical sector, and now it's less than 800,000 people. So you got to think about this in the context of 
of your majors and what you're doing uh, going forward. Um, if, you were to, if I were to ask you what sector of the economy lost more jobs in 2010 versus any other sector, anybody want to guess? What sector of our economy lost more jobs in 2010 than any other sector? Construction, maybe, and all that. Actually, it was the pharmaceutical sector. They lost an enormous number of jobs uh, in 2010, uh, roughly 10%. And they actually lost more jobs the year before, but the automotive industry lost more to men as a sector. And so there is, you know, there is a massive restructuring happening in healthcare that's driving this graph. These, this is a restructuring of jobs over the, the number of jobs lost over this period of time. And this is something to really think about as you choose careers and what's happening. And there's some really important mega trends that are, that are coming forth here. Um, I love to ask some of these questions here, too. This is from the did you know. You know, the top 10 in-demand jobs last year in 2010 did not exist in 2004. Right, we're really under a lot of dynamic change right now. We are currently preparing students for jobs that as of today are not yet formed using technologies that are just emerging. It's believed that one third of the current freshmen, sophomores, and juniors in school today are gonna go into jobs that as of today have yet been formed. Right, one third of you are going into jobs that have yet been formed. And listen, to, look at this one. The U.S. Department of Labor estimates that today's learner will have 10 to 14 different jobs by the age of 38. So to me, that's a staggering set of dynamics that are going to be uh, emerging here. And uh, one in four workers uh, have been with their current employer for less than a, than a year. So change is going to be constant. And this is actually where I believe that the value of a liberal arts education that you're all getting, or many of you are getting here, is that I actually believe that the liberal arts education is the one that's going to prepare you the best for entering this very dynamic situation that we are in. Because it's going to give you the ability to be lifelong learners, the ability to be adaptable, the ability to do critical analysis and adjust on the fly. These are the skills that I think come from a liberal art, a, a person trained in the liberal arts. And, uh, and that's why I think you're well positioned to be entering this, what might look chaotic, but what it clearly is, is a dynamic situation. And I think that you've got to look at your career as setting yourself up best for doing this uh, and being prepared and thinking about your networks and, and the ability to adapt in this type of environment. I love this quote from Goethe. Uh, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. This is sort of like the Nike commercial, right? Just do it. But it's like taking, the, it's like taking your liberal arts education and flipping it to the practice of the liberal arts, to actually engage and use your skills that you're getting here and actually do something with it. And that's why it's so terrific being here in the Y, uh, because that's what this is all about. Um, and so I've had the pleasure uh, over my career to work with a lot of different students. That was a young me way back when. Um, but the privilege of working with students, because what we do at the end of the day is all based on student achievement. And the faculty around here, for the most part, are in the, in the places they are because of the student achievement of the students that they worked with. And recognizing that that's really where the rubber meets the road. And, and encourage everyone here to be active in research and be active in, in doing something uh, that can bring tangible benefits uh, going forward. I think it's, um, there was a really interesting book, I used to have a slide on this, I didn't have it in here, um, that my wife bought me. It was called The Startup of You. And uh, I think my son pointed it out to me recently. But The Startup of You was written by the founders of LinkedIn. And it's how you can really think about yourself as like a startup company. And think about building your own networks, building your own, um, investing in yourself, think about lifelong learning. And it's really about thinking about yourself and sort of a, as a startup company. 
and they talk a lot about um, beta versions. You know, you've, you've seen software where there's a beta version of a software, and uh, you ought to think of yourself as constantly in a state of beta, that you're constantly rejuvenating uh, yourself, learning new things, and they have another quote in this book that finished is an F word in their point of view, in that you can't, you know, don't think of yourself ever as finished. I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do someday. But actually, constantly in that sense of, of, of renewal is really, really important. Um, and part of this activity for me has been um, a recognition that diversity is a fundamental tenet of innovation. Uh, Scott Page has a really ter terrific book out there called The Difference. And it talks about how in problem solving, diversity is, is extremely powerful uh, and that it can solve a lot of problems just by having a diverse set of experiences and perspectives around the table. And, um, and you know, he, he builds up a really compelling story that diversity drives a lot of innovation. And, you know, some people will then immediately ask, well, you know, what role does ability have? And, and clearly ability matters. But the point is, so does diversity. There's nothing more important in my experience and all the innovations that I've been associated with with our teams is a high, is a, is a high performing set of individuals with a diverse set of experiences. And that that's really the secret sauce for a lot of uh, innovation. Um, and that's what I think we bring really well here at, from the university is that breadth of experience the breadth of expertise, the breadth of perspectives. The key is getting all that together in order that one can sort of act as a team. It's sort of ironic. You can act as one with a diverse set of, uh, of interests and experiences going forward. And that's something we really try to do in our group. And it's you know, really recognizing that, in fact, if you're trying to optimize learning and education, you learn the most from those you have the least in common with. And so it's that delta of knowledge that allows one to reach a sort of an, an equilibrium of knowledge and a learning that's really, really powerful. And so that's something we've always tried to embrace. And we actually optimize for innovation by making sure that we have a diverse set of inputs on what we're doing. So you can optimize for innovation by embracing diversity. Um, in that context, I think it's important for all the young people, especially, to know who's in your corner and who's on your team and who's an advocate for you. And you know, this has taken me a number of years to be able to, to, be able to pull together who my, who my posse is, so to speak. Right? Uh, but this is a group of people that keep me uh, in line and help me uh, move different things forward and, and try to achieve all the different things that our teams involved with. And you'll see some characters on here that you're familiar with, Holden Thorpe uh, and I have been partnered for a long time. Uh, Mary Napier is in the back of the room, has been uh, is my total complement on so many different things that we move forward. Uh, Buck Goldstein you'll see there in the lower right. Uh, now I've got some new team members at the Keenan Institute. Uh, uh, with Ted Zoller and Jim Dean and Jim Johnson, uh, some CEOs that I've partnered with. And so I have a really good sense of my team. I know who I can go to to help all, do all sorts of different things. And it's, uh, it's really a terrific team. And I think everyone ought to know who's on your team. And it's important to be able to identify them. Um, you know, in, in the business world, there's a really terrific book out there. It's called Good to Great. Uh, by a man named Jim Collins, and it talks about business development. And it's, you know, I, I think we can use the same principles in good to great to think about what it is you want to do in your own lives. And we do this for our research program, and it, it calls it the hedgehog concept. And basically, it's an intersection of, of three questions What are you passionate about? At the end of the day, what motivates you? is a really important question. And make sure you really understand what you're, what, you're, what you're meant to do and what you think inspires you. And then you take that and you overlay that with another lens of what do you think you could be 
the best in the world at? Not that you are the best in the world at, but what do you think you could be the best in the world at? And then you lay that over with another set of lenses, is what are the economic drivers for that? And by that, you know, that's not just a for-profit statement. That's understanding financial sustainability in whatever it is you're doing. Whether you're trying to bring a new vaccine to the third world or understand a water test uh, or understand the ability to have students with musical instruments. Understanding the economic models are really important. And then often at the intersection of these three circles is something that Jim, ha uh, uh, Jim Collins referred to as a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal, a BHAG. And he talks about a, a good BHAG and bad BHAGs. Bad BHAGs are basically just a lot of bravado and you want to, you know, you want to do something, but you really didn't do the analysis. But a good BHAG is going through these three things and then recognizing that you actually could accomplish that, that big, hairy, audacious goal. And so that's something that my research group has been trying to do and all, always tries to do. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm going to skip I was going to walk you through some of these, but I'm just going to tell you about them and then I'll skip to the, some, some things of where we're going. Over the years, um, we've tried to take what we're best in the world at, or what we think we'd like to try to be, and that's we're material scientists at the end of the day. We like polymers and plastics, kind of like the, uh, the graduate, if you watch the graduate. Plastics, 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 right? And, uh, and so we've had activities in that world, and it ranges from new medical devices, uh, coronary heart stents that are dissolvable after 18 months, and partnered with Duke Physicians, and we developed a company, we sold it to Guidant, and we now have about 1,000 people with bioabsorbable stents in them. And we're about to get FDA, we're about to enter the U.S. market on that. Uh, we developed some clean ways of making high-end plastics like Teflon that eliminated uh, toxic organic solvents and toxic surfactants. And DuPont invested $60 million in a chemical plant for making Teflon based on our processes from the university. Uh, this, dry, this extended into dry cleaning of all things, and we got involved in some dry cleaning of clothes using carbon dioxide instead of chlorinated organic solvents. This has now emerged into our new activities. We're working on new generations of car batteries that would be non-flammable, um, and that's a huge unmet need uh, in the marketplace. It also has low temperature performance. Uh, we're working on vaccines, and we spun out a company called Liquidia that's got now 60 employees in Research Triangle Park. We've raised $60 million of venture capital, the last 10 million of which was a direct investment from the, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is the first equity investment ever by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in a for-profit biotech. And this guarantees access to our vaccine technologies for global access. And something a lot of the founders and everybody was really excited about using high-end technology for broadening uh, uh, or making sure of global access. We're working on new ways of delivering medicines via uh, inhalation powders and designing particles that um, make it much more effective for medicines delivered intra, uh, be the, into the lungs or intranasally, uh, and even accessing the blood-brain barrier through intranasal to address things like Alzheimer's and, and, and other central nervous system diseases. We've got a big program in oncology, and we've got some terrific data uh, for delivering more effectively nanomedicines in oncology and, and solid tumors. Uh, and we're trying to make synthetic blood. We have a big program. We have red blood cell mimics that we think could tr fundamentally transform the ability of delivering synthetic blood. You can think about car accidents or military needs. But the ones that's driving us is that if, you're, if you have a disease like sickle cell disease, you need lots and lots of transfusions. And people that get lots and lots of blood transfusions develop an allergy to blood. That's not good to be allergic to blood, right? You need it. And so we're working with ways of helping with those kinds of diseases. And then finally, we've got 
a, a device-assisted approach for delivering medicines to poorly vascularized tumors and pancreatic cancer. And so pancreatic cancer is known to be a, a disease that now people believe those tumors take 21 years to grow before they present, and when they present, it's too late. And those tumors are solid tumors, they're not well vascularized, and we have a medical device that, similar to the device that we thought that I was exposed to here in the stent world, now that we learn about oncology and we're using some electric field assisted delivery, that technology is an amalgam of three other experiences that my group had. And, it was, and so the take home lesson is a lot of innovation happens at the interface of other disciplines. And it was a synthesis of different ideas that came together for a new design. And it, to me, I think it's my liberal arts training and the liberal arts training of many in our group that allows us to see connections that are not so obvious at times. And I think that's a, you know, the real fundamental sort of secret sauce that our group has. So I'm gonna skip a bunch of slides here that was gonna go through all this. And uh, I'll show you one. This is a, this is our facility at our company, Liquidia that's now making products based on research from our laboratories here at the university. And this is a film-based processing for molding nanoparticles that go into everything from vaccines to synthetic blood to uh, new, new chemotherapy treatments. What I love about that is it's something really tangible and it actually is supporting products that are going into people in the clinic. And back in 2005, we had our first publication on this and you know, it's, it's striking to us that we were able to move it so quickly here in 2012 and actually have products and people. And that's what it takes engineers and, and, and uh, business development people and lawyers all coming together to make something like that truly happen. And it's, you, know, you have to pinch yourself at the end of the day. You see something emerge this quickly and actually into people. It's really, it's really fun uh, to get involved with. Um, so we're active in, in a lot of areas, but I sort of wanted to jump um, uh, to the end here. And I'm going to skip all the technologies because we just don't have time. And maybe cut to some important topics and maybe we can have a discussion. Why is it important at a university like the University of North Carolina that we are entrepreneurially active? Um, I think that many academic scientists, many students, can be or are really good problem solvers. But they often don't know where the problems are. And it's important to marry problem solvers up with people that own problems. Because uh, that's where the rubber meets the road, and that's where things really happen. And academic entrepreneurship drives that. You know, we in science and a lot of different disciplines, we publish papers and we have the peer review process and the peer review process is really rigorous, right? And we all sort of hold the peer review process up here on a pedestal and it is really rigorous. But I will tell you, when people invest in your company, that is peer review on steroids. And I think it makes our science better. A lot of these venture capitalists, a lot of people that are going to invest money in your, in your venture are going to apply, you know, unbelievable sorts of questions and measures on what you're doing. And being able to defend yourself in that dynamic is really important. And I, th I think it makes our science better. I've been at venture capitalists where they've brought in Nobel laureates, the guy that figured out the Big Bang. Um, he was a Bell Lab scientist, uh, Arno Pensius. He was drilling us on what we were doing. I mean, we had the, some of the best minds in the world drilling us, and it helps make our science better. And, um, and so that's, it's a, it, I think it's a gift. Every time somebody can ask you a, a tough question, that's a gift for, for your research. Um, it obviously allows one to have additional resources to make a true impact. It gives you broader bandwidth in, in accessing the literature and understanding what's been done and what's not been done, understanding the competition. It helps you writing grants. When you're an active entrepreneur, you're really good at understanding the critical question uh, and talking about the value proposition 
and coming up with a methodic game plan, and that really helps on grantsmanship. Um, it's an opportunity for scale up. You know, that plant I just showed you at Liquidia was a $60 million investment. That, you know, that takes real resources, usually outside the university, to do that. Um, and a lot of granting agencies nowadays really want to know, you know, this is National Institute of Health, National Science Foundation. They believe that they really want to move the results of the research into the marketplace. Because only when you do that do you actually affect people's lives. Uh, you could talk about a great new vaccine and you could, you could maybe do a study on a, on a mouse. But, you know, do you think Melinda Gates really cares about that? She doesn't. She wants to know how many, how many millions of people around the world are you actually going to save and what are you doing to get it there? And that takes a lot more than just science. That's understanding the culture of these places and how to, you know, how to affect change. And so that's really, again, the kinds of things that, that I think being uh, entrepreneurially active brings to the academic environment. And then the last thing I'll say is validates our science. When you do a lot of new things, I don't know about you, but you know, I, f I feel a little vulnerable coming out with a new thought, right? You sort of, you don't know if it's gonna stand the test of time. And there's nothing like, there's nothing more reassuring to me than when somebody reproduces what we've done. Because there's a lot of people talking, there's a lot of science out there that's not reproducible. And uh, when you get this kind of investment, you know darn well they've debugged certain things real quick to show that there's a there there, and there's nothing more validating to me than having somebody reproduce what we do. Um, there was a National Academy uh, study recently about research universities and the future of America. Um, let me just make some uh, uh, points with that. The United States is at a really interesting period in time. Um, we used to talk a lot about Bell Laboratories and a lot of these other big labs that were the centers of innovation for our, for our economy. And what's clear now is that have been dismantled. And there's a lot more focus on the research university as the hub for our economy, our national security, and our health and well-being. Universities are playing an increasingly important role in society. And, and uh, Bob Steele had this really great quote here. The role of research universities has never been more important with regard to their overall position of authority and leadership in our society. Bob was the chairman of the Board of Trustees at Duke. And this is really true. And, and, um, um, and there's a lot of competition going on out there. And you saw maybe recently the numbers of UNC's uh, success in federal research dollars. And I'll get to that point in a minute. But look what's happening around the country. Um, New York City. Mayor Bloomberg has given $100 million worth of real estate on Roosevelt Island to launch a new university in partnership between Cornell, the Technion in Israel, and Carnegie Mellon. And this is going to drive new, uh, the new economy, and it's really going to be based in New York City. Okay, uh, look what's happening uh, down in Southern California and the Nano Systems Institute and what Southern Cal is doing with Scripps and so many other places. There's a lot happening in Southern California. In Northern California, there's a place called QB3 Mission Bay San Francisco, which is all around quantitative biosciences. And there's some common themes between all of these activities. These are collaborative efforts typically between more than one university, three or four universities coming together, involving the whole campus uh, and intertwined with economic development and improving the economy and health and well-being. There's a lot of competition out there. And um, you know, it's important for us to be thinking about these issues and how we in North Carolina are going to compete. Um, I love this quote from uh, Jeff Bezos, the elimination of gatekeepers. It's never been easier in the history of time for you to start your own company of significance. And uh, you think about access to the internet, you think about the cloud and data storage, the tools, a lot of essential tools that we never could dream about are at your beck and call 
very inexpensively. The ability to start a company has never been easier than it is today. Uh, and the ability to do, to, for crowd accelerated innovation is clear. And the internet drives so much in inno innovation. Um, the curator of TED lectures, how many people watch TED lectures? Right, that's sort of, every, a lot of people do, right? We had a terrific opportunity to, to give a lecture at, the, at TED Med uh, in San Diego, and it was an incredible experience. 50 lectures over three days. And, um, but they talk about how a young boy in Africa put all, posted on the web his dance. And it went viral. And a lot of people were watching his, his it was a new uh, details of a dance that he, he demonstrated. And now how, how everybody then started to best his dance. And they said the dance evolved more quickly in the few years on the internet that it ever did in the history of time. And it just talks about how crowd accelerated innovation can really drive new approaches because you now are tapping the whole world in, in new ideas and new concepts. And it's a real powerful concept, whether it's dance or anything in technology. And there is, a, there is also clear uh, issues that we have a lot of problems today. And that only technology is, that technology is critical to solving. Um, and how things like clean tech is now a competitive advantage. Uh, the idea of having clean drinking water and clean societies is a competitive advantage. We have huge amounts of data that's, that is now available, whether it's sensors in your car, sensors in, in for earthquakes, uh, just all sorts of data and how we're going to be using that big data. You hear a lot of people talk about big data. You know, the idea of going beyond uh, the human genome and the fact that that's going to transform uh, how, we, how we think about ourselves and health and well-being, how we're now becoming increasingly a smart mobile world and all these electronic things that we carry around are going to change our world. Uh, technology is going to become really important. And one that I'm really excited about is how technology can actually drive costs down. And you think about a lot in healthcare, people talk about new technology driving costs up, and there's a lot of examples of that, but I think there's just as many opportunities for technology to drive costs down. Um, <clears throat> how many people saw the announcement this past week about UNC's rankings in research? We broke the top 10. We're number nine in the country. Federal research dollars coming into the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, we're ninth in the nation. We've been going from the upper teens to the lower teens, and now we broke the top 10. This is a big deal. The top 25 schools get over a third of the federal research budget. 25 schools get one third of the federal research budget. You really want to be on this list. If you link the ties that we just talked about, the role of a research university in our economy, this is really important for North Carolina that we have two schools on this list. Really, really important. Um, this is the fuel for knowledge growth and improving the health and well-being of society. Uh, I mentioned the top 25, 25 schools. You look at how we're positioned. California uh, has uh, five of these schools. Pennsylvania has three. And then North Carolina, Massachusetts, Maryland, and New York each have two. So it's really important for North Carolina to be on this list and so well represented. Wake Forest and NC State are in the top 100. So we have four schools in the top 100, which is very, very important. But I will say that we have no other school in the University of North Carolina system in the top 100. We have two public universities in the top 100. We have no other University of North Carolina system school in the second 100. And all the rest of the schools are in the third 100. Meaning they get a very small fraction of the federal research budget. There's something really special about a research university uh, and access to these federal dollars. And it changes the kind of education that you all have here relative to a place that doesn't have access to these funds. And it's something to keep in mind. Um, another interesting data point, of these top schools, there's only two schools on this list that don't have an engineering school. 
You're sitting in one of them. And the other one is University of California, San Francisco. That's interesting. That's interesting that we're so high on this list and we do not have an engineering school. Um, so, but despite the excitement of all these numbers, let me, let me give you an observation. MIT, for every $800,000 of research that they bring in, they kick out a patent. They, for every $800,000 of research, they can kick out a patent. For the University of North Carolina, it takes us over $8 million of research to kick out a patent. I would argue that engineering is a translational core discipline for unlocking value in a lot of the science that we do. And there are some schools that are really good at translating a science. Uh, but we have special issues in North Carolina when engineering is predominantly at NC State and a lot of the science is going on in Chapel Hill. We've got to find better ways of not, not stranding all that research dollars uh, and we've got to convert it into patents and into companies. And we've got to find new ways of build it, building partnerships with NC State and with Duke and our sister institutions is really what this is sort of my observation. And others are thinking about it too, for sure. So let me bring you to my, my new job title. Um, I've been uh, fortunate to uh, be appointed the next director of the Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise. This is a vision statement that I inherited and uh, it's to be the most influential institute in the world for entrepreneurship and innovation. Well, you know, so I sort of did a little bit of a SWOT analysis and, you know, who, who owns that title? Well, we're not quite there yet. Um, and, um, but we're based at a research university and we have that aspiration and we have a global perspective. And so these are the things that we're starting to think about and we're engaging in a strategic planning process right now. And we tapped, we, we looked at what's going on at UNC and who else went into a new organization from the outside that wanted to do a strategic plan. I reached out to Bubba Cunningham uh, in our athletics department and he engaged uh, Professor Paul Frigga in a school of business. And so Paul and his team is now uh, partnering with us and we're gonna go through a very formal strategic planning process to understand how we could actually achieve that vision uh, going forward. And, um, you know, the opportunity for the Institute, the Keenan Institute, to play a facilitative role uh, in helping to build the future of Uni University of North Carolina, the region, and the state is what we're trying to do. That's what we want to accomplish. Um, and the way we want to do this um, is, oh, you don't see the arrow on here. That's something I'll have to keep in mind, but there was a big arrow going across here. But we want to help companies get launched. We want to help, trans we want to help with a, an applied research agenda for the university. We want to tap the whole university. Uh, and we want to help position companies to help unlock some of the stranded research dollars that are here and really get it out into the community, whether it's for profit or not for profit, but to improve the translation of research out of the university going forward. And that's what we want to do. There's a lot of things going on at UNC as, I, as we start to get our arms around the innovation ecosystem at UNC. We have a lot of good stuff going on here. And this is sort of a, um, a snapshot of that. It may look like a shotgun to you. It sort of does to me a little bit. That we have, a, we've, we've launched a thousand flowers. And, uh, and that's part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem to do that. And, to the extent that we have all these different activities, Campus Y is here and other things, there's a lot of, and I'm sure there's stuff we're missing, uh, but to help foster these different uh, um, activities on campus is something we're interested in and it's one of the reasons why we were here today. Um, maybe a little plug for the entrepreneurship minor. Um, the Coffin Foundation stood this up. The Coffin Foundation actually owns, I think, they're the most well-recognized institute for entrepreneurship in the country. But the University of North Carolina got a really great grant from the Coffin Foundation, written by the Keenan Institute, to launch the entrepreneurship minor here several years ago. And uh, this is our most popular minor now. And uh, we've, we bring all the kids in in a fall semester. And we basically go from an idea to, to an achievement. And then in a the spring semester, we break them up into tracks, groups of 25 kids or, or about. 
And historically, we've had four tracks, tech ventures, commercial ventures, social ventures, and artistic ventures. And each one of those classes is paired up between a faculty member and a practicing entrepreneur. I teach in the tech, uh, tech ventures group, and Lowry Caudill and I co-teach that class. The artistic ventures, one of the, the lead people is uh, part of the management team from Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and our, you know, artistic ventures. We're going to stand up sport ventures in the spring of 2013. And so we'll have a fifth track uh, going forward. You'll be hearing more about that on campus uh, soon. Um, and it's a pretty exciting program. And it's got related things. You know, Chancellor Thorpe is now teaching a broad intro freshman program. It's got 400 plus students. And we participate in a faculty boot camp. <clears throat> so let me, uh, let me end there. Uh, I am privileged to be here and do what I do. I remind people that are there are three types of people on this planet that are, or in this society, that get to wear a robe. Um, it's judges, religious, and scholars. And it's a privileged position in society to be able to do that, and do what we do, and work with students. And so I, you know, I'm always very appreciative of that. And everything that we do at the end of the day is all based on student achievement and their success of their careers. And it's, it's really a true privilege. And then you know, also recognizing that Vision without resources is a hallucination. And we've got to always think about the financial model and how and these are the folks that fund our research uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to National Science Foundation to NIH, NCI, and Fed, uh, states resources from the University Cancer Research Fund. So with that, uh, let me end um, my Twitter account if you want to follow. I'm trying to compete with Jim Dean in the business school about who has more followers and he's way ahead of me. So uh, please follow the, uh, the Twitter account. Anyway, thank you for inviting me. I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> questions? Yes? Is the funding in primarily for tech or is that No, no, it's not. My colleague, Jim Johnson, um, is focused on a lot of issues uh, about uh, uh, urban, uh, competitive urban economies, and uh, but also we do a lot of rural development too. And and uh, you know what's interesting about North Carolina? I heard Governor Purdue this morning on CNN say we're poised to be the seventh most populous state. I know we're ninth now, and I don't know who we're about to pass. I think we just passed New Jersey, uh, for what that's worth. But we have the highest percentage of our population that's rural of any other state. That's an interesting dynamic for this state. And so understanding the kinds of businesses that are going to thrive across the rural as well as the urban environments and the clustered environments are going to be important. I think given my experience base and given this observation about research dollars in at UNC and the translation, we're going to, I think we can help move the ball down the field and do some things differently there. As I learn about activities here at the Y, and the, and the opportunities for uh, more social ventures here. Uh, and I think there's opportunities for MBA students to be tying in more programmatically with what's going on here on campus. There's, you know, there's hundreds of MBA students over there that are just like you know, a lot of the undergraduates here, just a little bit older and a little bit more experienced. And, but they have a lot of the same social uh, values that you all have. And they want to give back. And they have a lot more experience. They have a lot of experience. And so the ideas of pairing that up to help launch more social ventures, I think, is a real possibility. Yeah? In the beginning, you said that um, the U.S.'s share of like, global, I guess, research or has gone down. But yeah. is that just a factor of the fact that other people have gone up? Or have our numbers remained constant? Or have, they, have the absolute numbers actually gone down? No, I, you know, I think, we're, I, I think it ebbs and flows. I mean, it depends on which specific agency. Uh, but you know, we've put a, a big part of our uh, economy back into research and so we're and we've still been increasing with that but as a rate of increase other places are growing faster um, but you know as economy as a worldwide economy slows down you you read rumblings all over the planet regarding curtailing those things um, but you know good research anywhere is good for research everywhere and so I know that the director of the National Science Foundation said something to that effect recently. And, 
and the idea of helping, you know, helping economies who are starting to invest in research with peer review and how to do good research and what are the standards of that, you know, I think we can play a helpful role there. Yeah. With your 130 patents and then with all the patents that the university cranks out each year, I was just curious to know what you personally do and what UNC as an institution does to manage and perhaps monetize those patents. Is there yeah. a, a platform or a system? So, <clears throat> yeah, there's a, there's a robust system uh, out there. And these, these cost a lot of money. And so, you know, some of the early patents that I was involved with, you know, we don't have a budget pool for patents. Uh, that that's, has grown very much. Um, and so departments are often helping out young faculty, and that's what happened in my case. My very first patent, I think the university asked the department chairman if he would pay for it. And um, it turned out to be a good investment. Um, and, uh, but what happens is the university has to very quickly, the way we're structured, get the cost of these patents into someone else's hands. Because we, we can't bankroll these. We transiently bankroll them. Um, and we would lose the money if we don't, if the patent becomes useless uh, and it doesn't, doesn't go into somebody's hands quickly. And so the university is working, it's almost like trying to, you know, a race against a clock to get these things filed, create value, and then get them in the hands of somebody that can pay that money back and then create a company. And so, uh, you know, Liquidia is a big chunk of the university's is paying a big chunk of the university's patent payroll right now. So what's interesting is my group is still filing four or five new patents a year. And, uh, and they end up uh, getting licensed into Liquidia. Liquidia reimburses the university and, and that's handled that way. Liquidia just had a big partnership announced with GSK. Uh, and part of that is a, is a dollars flowing back to the university and then it gets split according to the university distribution policy. And so there's a pretty robust system out there. But the problem is, for 500 plus millions of dollars of research, the university ends up bankrolling a certain amount of patents. And so you need, you need to have, you need to understand how much money you need to support that. And if that budget were cut in half, that's going to be, puts more viscosity and the ability of the university to move the technologies forward. And so that's a problem. And so we got to think about the patent budgets and what's it appropriately sized for the amount of research that we're doing. You had a question? Um, I, I wanted to know how much the state of North Carolina, the government, municipal or federal government, um, has to contribute to the you know, I, you know, I think a lot of people are interested in it. A lot of people are doing things about it. And, um, you know, Research Triangle Park started a lot of these activities, right? There's 40,000 people that work in RTP right now. And, um, and so the state has been very proactive. I think our economy has been differentiated in the southeast because of forward-thinking people back in the 50s that helped move us, you know, out of what we were doing into tech and biotech and nanotech. Um, in pharma. Uh, so there's a lot of people really thinking about these topics. Um, and, uh, but now you see what's happening around the country. The competition is, is, you know, is on high octane gas right now. And how do we compete going forward? And so we're working with uh, trying to put a get together a grant now for the, something called an i -Core, Innovation Core grant to the National Science Foundation to allow this region to be a node on a national network of nodes for helping to expose faculty and students to entrepreneurship. And there were three nodes set up last year at Stanford and Michigan and, and Georgia Tech. And now there's a new competition out there and we're trying to become a mid-Atlantic RTP wide node jointly with our colleagues of NC State, Duke, and Carolina. And so we're, a lot of people are working towards these goals. But the partnerships here can be improved. I, there's probably nothing, there's probably no relationship in the world that can't be improved. But I can tell you that our partnerships here need to be improved. And we have a lot of competition. We love basketball and football competition. And, you know, we're eight miles from Duke and 20 miles from State. And, you know, sometimes I think that intensity, 
you know, goes too far at times. All right? We've got to be acting as one. There's an opportunity for us to be acting as one uh, as we not only think about competition in New York and San Francisco and Southern California and, and Mumbai and Beijing and London, you know, Research Triangle is a strong brand. And we, if you look at the resources of the universities here, we're, we're tough competition against anybody if we're coordinated. And, that, and I think there's opportunities for improving what we do. Yeah. Um. You know, as we start to see more um, university research universities become more and more focused on research and more and more funding comes in for research and entrepreneurship, um, is, there an, is it important to kind of continue to maintain that liberal arts focus? Is there any risk that that would kind of get pushed to the side through research uh, focus? And is that even a problem or a danger that you have to kind of pay attention to? Or how, how do you see that? Well, you know, I, I think it needs constant attention to it. Um, and I think it needs a clear articulation of the value of it. But, you know, a lot of people get that. You know, there's been things written at the National Academy of Engineering about trying to train engineers more in a liberal arts fashion. You know, again, back to diversity. You don't want everybody trained the same way. The ecosystem across the nation benefits from different people being educated different ways. And, uh, you know, I think the the prominence of such a strong liberal arts university on that list is our, you know, it's our forte. And it can, one, be really help differentiate our product, our, our students, in that global marketplace. And I think it fills an important niche. But, um, you know, I, again, but I, I'm, you know, I'm a really passionate advocate about the, having grown up in a residential liberal arts college system myself, about the importance of that and what helps our success. I just have one more question before you leave. Yeah. Um, from your entrepreneurial path, um, what would be the top three tips or top three lessons learned that you would like to share with aspiring social entrepreneurs here? That's a terrific question. <laughs> what three tips? Um, you know, I think understanding, I think, I wish I would have learned earlier who was in my network um, than I do now. I think it would, have been, uh, it would have been more effective for me had I really nurtured and understood a network more. Because they, they, they really amplify what it is one, what one does. Um, I think... Um, you know, I, always, I, I, I wish I was a better writer. You know, I wish my grant, our grantsmanship was even better than it is. Um, and I, and I, wish I, you know, I wish I practiced what I preach more um, in a sense that uh, we recently got, a, uh, we got some grants skewed up. Um, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in, in partnering and domain experts. And we were writing some renewal grants and um, we felt that we understood the literature in a synthetic blood area, as an example. We thought we understood the literature in this area. Um, and I didn't bring in a domain expert who actually did blood for a living. And uh, you know, I sort of slept at a Holiday Inn, felt good, thought we could read the literature, and we could, we could pass, our, pass our way through this. And we didn't. And we got, we're going to get self-corrected. So you know, partnering with domain experts and remembering that all the time um, being a better uh, writer and understanding the network. So a lot of these are sort of collaboration sort of co uh, issues. All right, last question. Sure, last question. There you go. Uh, I believe you graduate uh, with a science degree. And have you always set your eye on entrepreneurship? And if not, from the beginning, when did you transition from pure research to entrepreneurship? And how did you take that step from being just a researcher? That's a, it's a great question. So I went to a small liberal arts residential college uh, in Pennsylvania, or Sinus College, where my son graduated, and uh, just recently. And uh, I went to Virginia Tech for graduate school. And I'm a proud Hokie. And Virginia Tech is a technical school. 
and I got exp and I was with a great you know I think faculty change lives and I am I am the product of working with great mentors who changed my life and so I worked with a man named James McGrath who there was nobody better in the world I thought to this day that can understand uh, a material and its function and how it could have some utility and I sort of understood his craft he shared his craft with us and so getting that experience combined with my liberal arts education I think were the two keys uh, that when we started here we, we were focused on utilitarian research sort of in the Thomas Jeffersonian like uh, perspective we wanted to do things that was useful to society but for us there's nothing more valuable than a paper in science which is the best journal as you know in our field and an important patent and I love I love the intermixing of those two activities so let me stop there and thank you for uh, for coming <laughs>